bonjour la classe. It is Christmas chaos in here today. We had a little kids painting session at the weekend. So I've got a lot of Christmas trees and wreaths drying on all available surfaces. Over here, I've been sweeping the chimney. Obviously, so Father Christmas can get down. And today I am working on getting some Christmas cards to the printers. It's a surprisingly tricky thing getting a Christmas card right. Um, I, I thought I had loads of lovely wintry pictures from last Christmas and winter, um, but when you start cropping them and chopping them and uh, getting them from this big to this big, it's strange how quite a lot of it doesn't really work. Right, that's quite enough screen time. I think an outing is afoot. I'm going down to Macclesfield now because I've got a painting and a little exhibition in what's called the 01625 gallery. That is cannily named after our area code because, believe it or not, it's in a telephone box. In fact, a pair of telephone boxes. And while I'm down there, I'm hoping to meet Lucy, who's organised it, and her friend Patty, who's another artist who's taken part. Let's hit the road. Well, dear friends, welcome to the People's Republic of Macclesfield. I have just got into town, so I'm wandering up to the centre to see if I can find these fabled telephone boxes. Let's see what we can find. So here they are, these fantastic telephone boxes full of okay. pictures. I'm um, yeah, really thrilled to come down and see this. And <laughs> um, Yeah, I'm Lucy Fitzpatrick yeah. and uh, Macclesfield Town Council uh, commissioned me to um, install uh, four exhibitions throughout 2023. There was 32 Mac artists exhibiting in the phone boxes. Each one has got a very different style and we just really wanted to promote artists during Christmas time. Would you like to introduce Patty? Yes, I'm here with Patty Callahan, <laughs> aka Paper Mache Patty. Do you want to show me something on there which you found particularly striking? I actually really liked Ailsa's poem. It's I don't, I'm not good at poetry, I don't know much about it, it's, it's a bit sort of ooh, scary and out there, but I, what I like about her poems is they're really, really accessible. You yeah. should be about really and, it's, oh, and it's next yeah. to you, it's <laughs> yeah, next to yours. It feels like I love that. As if I deliberately yeah, yeah, it. handy. Honestly, I didn't. But. Was it, was it easy to find 32? Um, we got like 33. Oh, people perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Coming down, it does feel like strikingly Maxonian. Yeah, outside the town uh, hall as well. Like, yeah. Really yeah, yeah. I've just seen my own picture down here. Which is, yeah, I'm really. Ex it's really exciting. So, folks, I've got a bit of a guilty admission. Today isn't actually today, or to put it another way. I've had to come back to get more footage. Um, I think in my, my inexperience, um, I, uh, I didn't get really enough. Uh, so here we go, take two. Let's see if we can't get some better footage of this little micro gallery. I, uh, I actually think it's worked out quite well in a way, having this, this inadvertent gap um, of a few days between coming down to see the exhibition um, last week and then coming down again because it's given me a chance to have a think about um, the work and the exhibition and my response to it and I think what's really interesting is with both the Christmas cards um, and the telephone box exhibition it's asked a really interesting question about reproducibility and how well certain pieces of art can be reproduced from the original. What really struck me looking at the 01625 exhibition is that some pieces there just look brilliant and to be brutally honest 
I don't think mine did. So what was the difference between those which looked great and those that didn't? And what struck me straight away is that the graphic stuff, the photography, the illustration, the digital art worked really, really well. But the paintings didn't. So yeah, either my paintings are a bit crap, which is not, not an impossible scenario, uh, or there is something about different sorts of art that allows them to be reproduced or not. So as I make my way home, I thought I'd just have a little muse on a few of these thoughts. So yeah, let's hit the road. Reflecting on this idea of reproducibility basically made me think of a of a of an essay I was really interested in when I was at university um, by Walter Benjamin. It's called "The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction," um, and yeah, Benjamin was uh, a German. He was a German Jewish writer working before the First World War. He was intrigued by how new forms of technology lithography, photography that were developing at that time might change our relationship with art and the art we make as we get the power to reproduce things infinitely um, and and easily. There's there's an awful lot in the essay, it's one of those like chunky philosophical essays with a lot of different concepts in it to unpack but the one I want to talk about today is the idea of aura um, and and how a piece of art might have something beyond just its aesthetics and have some sort of spirit or soul. What is aura then for Walter Benjamin? Well, it's this sort of special quality that comes with the uniqueness of a piece of art. The way I interpret it, it's like a mixture of its sort of physicality, its unique physicality, its, its patina and its kind of the trace of history on it. Um, and how it's placed and held within a tradition. This is kind of perfect uh, in terms of thinking about aura and patina, because if we look at the stonework here on this, on this door on the Lady Chapel, which I think is one of the really old bits of this church, you can see just the trace of history on on that carving, it's been worn by the tribulations of time. There's um, there's marks from tools, there's marks from weather, and there's even places where it's been repaired. And there's the old and the new side by side, and that tells a whole other kind of story. <laughs> Another kind of key source for aura is this idea of tradition. And I'm going to reach for a timeless cliche here because it actually fits really well. Uh, the cliche is part of the aura, you could say. Um, and that cliche is the Mona Lisa. Um, because the Mona Lisa is the most famous painting in the world, in the most famous gallery in the world, in the world's most artistic city, in the world's most stylish country, Belgium. Uh, I might need to fact check that. But Benjamin would credit some of the power of the Mona Lisa because it sits within that tradition. We've given it a context of power. You wouldn't dream of standing in front of the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, seeing how many new subscribers you've got on YouTube on your phone but on the other hand you can buy a postcard of the Mona Lisa and stick it on your fridge and do all sorts of unspeakable things in front of it (laughs) 
Yeah, and then there's also the element of physicality, which, you know, patina kind of fits into that, but I suppose it's the bit that maybe is most relevant for my thinking about painting. Physicality is like the fact that a piece of painting might not just be two-dimensional. That is actually an object. It has ridges and furrows and marks, and you can see where the brush has touched it, you can see where the the uh, the knife has worked it, and that that it's a thing in the world. It's a one-off, it's unique. And you could have a crack at copying it, but it's not that easy to copy. Um, and perhaps if you did, you'd lose something. So yeah, that physicality is interesting. I was gonna go under this bridge, I'm gonna fall off. So, so that's Aura, and I think a really neat evocation of Aura is um, the books of Philip Pullman, his Dark Materials. They're young adult books, and he, he does something interesting as much as he gives his human characters a sort of external soul in the form of, of, of an animal. Um, and this animal is connected to them, it can't leave them, it takes a form that reflects their personality um, and it's visible outside the body to others and, and this is what he calls a demon and, and in the books the sort of dark uh, the dark storyline is that experiments are being made on children and they're having their demons removed severed is the word he uses um, and it doesn't kill them but removing this demon is uh, enough to render them kind of lifeless and hopeless and grey and wan. And obviously Walter Benjamin was a big Northern Lights fan because there's a lot of similar language used. Pullman talks about severing and Benjamin talks about like withering or prying a living object from its shell. So making my Christmas cards um, or, or reproducing a painting onto a piece of Corex I think I'm in danger of doing something similar, um, of uh, of like severing the demon from my painting, which um, well, it's not not very Christmassy, is it? As you can see, the sun has come out now after a few days of grey, and um, on this little bike ride home on the canal, it's lovely. What a <laughs> So all that thinking about like spirits and demons and aura, it makes me think that about the kind of alternate power of the graphic arts, you know, and why it works well in those telephone boxes. You know, graphic art doesn't have aura, but it has got other power. Its power is reproducibility. It's its power to reach a lot of people and for them to be able to get close to it and perhaps also to consume it easily uh, and readily and that's another point Benjamin comes on to but probably not one to get into here but at the core of it when we're thinking about aura and we think about the qualities of the work there is something incontrovertibly different about something made through the means of technical reproduction that is easy to disseminate and something that has the quality of uniqueness um, and a kind of solidity as a physical object. When I paint, I'm, I suppose I'm asking you to bear witness on a physical process, on something with a history, however short, um, and I, I suppose I'm really trying to make something that still feels alive even after even after I finish painting it and, and that, that is the magic of, 
of, of oil paint. I'm making stuff that I want you to contemplate and I want you to concentrate on. Um, and I wonder if that's kind of fundamentally at odds with trying to reproduce the work um, in that very two-dimensional way. I think it's a fascinating coincidence that the images in the telephone boxes are actually arrayed as if they were in a news feed or, or Instagram feed. And I reckon Walter Benjamin would be completely fascinated by that because something else he goes on to speak about in the in the essay is how as like we desire art to be closer we want to be able to uh, to reproduce it bring it closer to ourselves but as we do so our attention span um, diminishes and we give it less time and he's really interesting on the the kind of spectrum between concentration and distraction which feels so prescient so it's been making me think a lot about the Christmas cards and which paintings to choose um, my, my mother-in-law has always said that she thinks that oil paintings don't work as cards because people don't get it and or, or they don't get it as much as they get a watercolour or a lithograph or a drawing reproduced. Um, yeah, so, so maybe I need to heed that advice um, and recognise an oil painting for what it is and, and recognise what it is that makes it special. But thanks as ever for watching. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these, these thoughts, whether you see it as an interesting unpacking of art history or just a very verbose way to complain about how crap my picture looked. But either way, uh, I, I very much appreciate you watching. I hit 50 subscribers this week, which felt like a big milestone. It's really special that so many people are interested in this work that I'm up to. So thanks very much and I'll look forward to seeing you again before too long. Bye. I'm fascinated by that. What is a cultural gift? Is it, is it possible that a gift can't be cultural? Aren't, aren't all gifts cultural? Can you have a gift outside of culture? Fascinating.